so much for coming today. I've been looking forward to seeing all of you all morning long. My name is Justin Smith. I'm an interpreter with the Huron Clinton Metro Parks out of the Oakwoods Nature Center, just a little ways down the road. But I was invited here by Brittany from the River Raisin Institute to put on this frog program for you guys today. And again, thank you so much for coming out. Now, during this program, we are going to be going on a little walk, a little bit less than a half mile, just a little loop out here. And if you do need to use the bathrooms, there are some porta johns out there. I would recommend using the one that's standing up, not the one that's laying down. That would be a lot, a little more comfortable. But today, we're going to be looking at one of the animals that's my absolute favorite animal on the whole face of the earth. Because since I was about as big as all of these guys right here, I couldn't wait for the snow to, and you too, I couldn't wait for that snow to melt. Because once that snow melted and the grass started to grow, in my front yard we had a ditch. And that ditch would fill up with water. And I would hear these noises coming out of that ditch. So when I was about as big as Mr. Ninja right here, I would get down on my belly and I would sneak up towards that ditch. And I would try to catch frogs. So who here has also done that? Raise your hand if you've caught a frog before. Nice. Raise your hand if you've never caught a frog before. Raise your hand if you would like to catch a frog. Well then this program is for you because this program today we're going to be looking at our frogs and toads of Michigan, specifically the ones that we can find kind of here. We're going to be learning about the adaptations they have that make them wonderful at surviving because if you're a frog, you're kind of squishy, you don't have big fangs, you don't have big claws, it seems like, you know, you'd have a hard time surviving, but because of the way they're made, they're actually really good at surviving in the habitats that they choose to live in. But unfortunately, some of those same adaptations make them really susceptible to the, some of the things that we do to their habitat. So we're gonna learn about that too. And uh, we're gonna have a good time when we do it. Now, first of all, if we're talking about frogs, though, I need your help. Can everybody hear? Can you put up one of your hands like this for me? Especially if you want. Now I want you to take that hand and I want you to stick it under your shirt. <laughs> like this. Don't worry, this has to do with frogs, I promise you. Because, what do you notice? You might you might have cold hands. If your hands are cold like mine, you're like, oh, it's kind of chilly. Yeah. But as you're holding your hand there, is it starting to feel a little bit warmer? Mm -hmm. Now, can you reach all the way into your armpit? No, don't do that. I'm just joking. That's too hard. You guys, you can take your hand I out. I can. You can? <laughs> You've got a good reach. There's always one that can. Yeah. Your hand probably started to feel a little bit warmer because you guys are all warm-blooded. Mm -hmm. We're mammals. We have hair, we have backbones, we have four-chambered hearts. We make our own body heat. Yeah, stick them in there, keep them warm. But when we're talking about frogs, we're talking about amphibians. Amphibians that come from the Greek amphibios, which means two lives. And these guys are cold-blooded. So during the winter, they're hibernating. They're down underneath the water. They're under the leaf litter. They're under logs. They're places where they're not going to freeze. Well, some of them actually are going to freeze, but they're getting, they can't survive when it gets really, really cold. So they have to wait for it to warm up. And being cold blood doesn't mean they're cold. It just means they don't make their own body heat. So when the weather's cold, they get cold. When the weather's warm, they get warm. And if you're an amphibian, you start your life as one of these. A little squishy jelly light egg. Raise your hand if you've ever seen frog eggs before. Yeah, because if you're an amphibian, you start your life with an egg that's usually laid in the water. And who knows what comes out of those little amphibian eggs? What comes out? A tadpole. Yeah. The thing that comes out is going to be a little squiggly tadpole. It looks like just a head and a tail, which is kind of cool because tadpole actually means toad's head which is just the head. And if you ever heard of a polywog, yeah, polywog just means wiggling head, which is kind of cool too. And that's gonna be growing up into the adult frog. Now we're not gonna spend a whole lot of time on our tadpoles. We're gonna go, some cool sandhill cranes out there. We're gonna be looking more at the adults of the amphibian species, the adult frog. And we're gonna be looking at what makes them special. Because the first things that crawled out of the water, if you go back in time about 360 million years, we just had things living in the water, things like fish. The first one that crawled out uh, was our first amphibian. And it didn't look anything like a frog today. If you want to see an amphibian that looks like a frog, you have to go back about 150 million years. So 
So frogs have been around for a long time. Well, let's take this frog and let's put him in my container over there. Well, we're gonna take our little walk and we're gonna learn about what makes frogs special. So come with me. Now, if you're on the boardwalk, I want you to take a look on the side. See if, can you see anything over here? Anybody see any frogs? I was out here yesterday trying to see if I can find some. I can't see any frogs. Because the first thing that makes a frog special is its skin. And you know, I've got a picture of frog skin right over here if you want to take a look at it because you might not be seeing any frog skin off on the sides right now. Because frog skin is really good at helping a frog be camouflaged. And camouflage just means it makes it really hard to see. They blend in really well. And if you're like me and you like to find frogs, you probably know that feeling where you're walking along the edge of a pond or a river or a lake and poop, something jumps right in front of you and it splashes in the water. You're like, oh, there's frogs here. I'm gonna keep my eye open and look for frogs. So you're looking, you're looking, you take another step, splush, another one jumps in. You take another step, splush, another one jumps in and you don't see any of them. You're like, I'm looking for them. And they have this skin, this beautiful skin that it's usually kind of greenish, kind of brownish. Some of them are all almost kind of reddish. Some of them are even kind of bluish. But this skin gives them outstanding camouflage. And yeah, it helps them hide in the grass. They blend in with the water. They blend in with the cattails. But this skin is super special because if it was not COVID, I'd have you take your shirts and pull your shirt up over your nose like the kid next to you farted. But since you're all wearing masks, you don't even have to do this because take a couple breaths for me. Just take a couple breaths in and out. Oh, I'm holding that up. You can breathe through your mask, right? Because your mask can you guys say a word with me? This is kind of a big word, but it's important. Can you all say permeable? Permeable. Permeable is a big word. It's a fancy word that just means it has holes in it. Things can go through it because amphibian skin, frog skin is permeable, which means gases can go through it. The oxygen in the air can go through a frog skin. Liquids can go through it. Like I imagine, imagine this guy's drinking like a can of Coca-Cola. And I'm sitting next to him in school and I want some of that Coca-Cola. If I was a frog with permeable frog skin, I could just kind of creep up to him. He could have his glass of Coca-Cola. I could take my finger and go. And I could drink it through my skin. Because when a frog drinks, has anyone ever seen a frog take a glass of water and drink it through its mouth? Well, no, because they don't have hands that can pick up glasses of water, but yeah. a frog almost never drinks water through its mouth. They just don't do it because they're absorbing the water through their skin. When they're breathing, have you ever seen a frog, how its throat goes like that? No. You've never said, well, keep your eyes open because they do that. What they're doing when they're pulsing their throat up and down, they're actually forcing air, not through their nose, because they can breathe through their nose like you and me, but they're taking extra air and they're pumping it through their skin which is why when a frog jumps in the water and you're waiting for it to come up, you're like, okay, it's gonna come up and I'm gonna grab it. It's actually absorbing oxygen from the water through its skin, which lets it stay down a really long time, which is why you get bored and you walk away and the frog's like, aha, I thwarted the kid. But there's a problem with that 
because they can also absorb other things through their skin. What happens if we took some chemicals and dumped it in the water here? Do you think they could absorb those through their skin? Yeah, they totally could. And the neat thing about what makes that skin permeable, this is my favorite, it's called glandular skin because it has glands in it. And you know what those glands make? They make mucus. Do you know what mucus is? When you blow your nose, you know that stuff that comes out? That's mucus. Frogs are actually secreting mucus all across their skin. That's what keeps that skin permeable, which is also why a frog that's away from the water, it dries out which is why most of the time we don't find frogs in places that are really dry. There's always exceptions because nature loves exceptions, but most of our frogs, we find them in wet places, like rivers and lakes and ponds and streams where they can be in the water. That mucus on their skin keeps it permeable so they can breathe through their skin, they can drink through their skin. And also if you grab something that's covered in snot, it's kind of hard to hold on to, isn't it? Which is a great thing to keep predators from being able to grab you because they have that glandular mucusy skin and I think it's really beautiful. So let's continue on down this way. And I want you to keep your eyes on me while we're walking, just see if you might be able to spot any frogs while we're walking. Because as human beings, we have really amazing eyeballs. And as frogs, frogs have really amazing eyeballs too. Because there's a problem if you're a frog. If you're a frog, you're, you're kind of delicious. There's a lot of things that want to eat you. And one of your biggest defenses from being eaten is to have really good eyes so you can see the things that want to eat you before they can see you. Which is why when you're walking along the edge of that pond or that lake or that river, usually that frog, it jumps before you can even see it because, well, if you guys were frogs, your eyeballs wouldn't be here. They'd be up on top of your head. And they'd be really, really, really big. And here's the cool thing about frogs. Frogs see really well when things are far away. But if you asked a frog over to read a book with you, you'd probably have to give it some reading glasses because frogs actually do not have good vision close up. When things are close up, like when we feed our frogs at the nature center, you can take a bug and you can put it like right in the front of the frog and the frog's like, until that insect moves. Because whether something's far away or whether it's close up, a frog's eyes are super good at seeing things that are moving. They have really good sensitivity to motion. They have really good night vision and they have really good distance vision. And their eyeballs are up here because if you're delicious, it makes sense that you might want to hide. So I'm sure we've all seen frogs and their eyeballs are on the tops of their head so that they can just kind of sink underneath the water. Can you do that too? You can sink underneath the leaf litter with just those eyeballs sticking out. It's almost like you have two periscopes on top of your head, so they can be all protected underneath something. They can be looking around for predators, which are the things that want to eat them. Because if you're a great blue heron, or if you're a raccoon, or if you're a mink, or if you're one of those, all these other things that like to eat frogs, they want to spot them first. And there's something else that these eyeballs are really good for. It's a mute swan. Like a swan fight almost. Yeah. Who here has ever taken a bite of food that was so big you had a hard time swallowing it? And your mom was like, hey, you better chew your food. You're like, oh, 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 you're trying to swallow your food. If you're a frog, you use your eyeballs to help you swallow. Whenever a frog eats its food, well, you'll see them grab their food, they blink really hard. And those big eyeballs on the top of their head actually push through the skull and help push that food down their throat. So try that the next time you have like a really, like you've got a gobstopper in your mouth or a really big bite of peanut butter and jelly sandwich, just blink really hard. And it won't do anything for you because you're not a frog. But if you were a frog, those eyeballs would help push that food down your throat. And here's my next challenge for you guys. Frog challenge number one. I want you guys all to close your eyes and then I want you to look at the picture I'm gonna show you next, but you have to have your eyes closed. Close your, so close your eyes. Okay, tell me what picture I'm holding up. 
No, you have your eyes on. Okay, open your eyes. You guys aren't very good at that frog challenge, but that's okay because you're not frogs. Because if you're a frog, you have a third eyelid, a transparent eyelid called a nictitating membrane. It's, a spe it's like built-in swim goggles. It closes over your eye when you're under the water. And they also use it when they're about to eat some food. Because when a frog goes to eat food, well, you're gonna see that in a little bit, they close their eyes because it protects their eye. Because if you've got giant eyes and you're going under the water, you want something to poke into it. So right here, can you see this third eyelid, this thing here? This is that nictitating membrane. I can't see. I know you can't see because it's way far away. I'll bring it over to where you are. So if you were a frog, you would have built in swim goggles, which is totally cool. Okay, so my challenge for as we're walking now, we're gonna go a little bit farther. I'm gonna take out my real frog and uh, keep your eyes open. Use all three of your eyelids. Keep all three of your eyelids open and let's go see what we can see over in this area. But the reason I cannot let my frog out is because not only do frogs have that amazing permeable skin, not only do they have those amazing eyes on top of their head that give them that really good distance vision, but frogs have really amazing frog legs. And if we looked at my frog right here, anybody know what kind of frog this one is? Bulldog? You got it. This bullfrog right here. Yeah. If you took a frog and you took all of its pieces and you weighed them all, the legs make up 25% of the entire weight of the frog. So can you imagine like a quarter of your entire weight is in your legs? Yes. Because frogs are really good at jumping. But here's the thing. Scientists have looked at the muscles in a frog's leg. They've measured how much power they put out. And they're like, it's impossible. It's just impossible. A frog could not jump as far as it can jump just based on the muscle of its legs. They don't have enough power. And it wasn't until 10 years ago that some scientists took a camera, an X-ray camera that could measure things super duper fast, and they watched leopard frogs jump in high-speed X-ray vision, and they saw that it's not the muscles that do the big work. It's the tendons. So here I need everybody to do something. Everybody stand up on your toes for me like this. Stand up on your toes. Okay, now it's feeling the back of your foot right here because you have a really big tendon in the back of your foot. It's called your Achilles. Yeah, if you've got boots, you won't be able to feel it. Called your Achilles tendon. And if you're a frog, can you feel it? Cool, you've got that toe. If you're a frog, your Achilles tendon wraps all the way around under your foot. Your foot is really, really, really long. And when the calf muscle of a leopard frog fires, bam! It takes about a hundred milliseconds, a tenth of a second. And what that does is it puts, oh, he's like, what are you doing? It takes that tendon and it goes, yoink. So everybody do this for me. Pretend you are shooting a bow. Take your bow in your arm. Now pull back the bowstring. Whoop! What you just did is what the calf muscle does. The calf muscle pulls back the bowstring, which is the frog's tendon. Now release your arrow. Boing! You know how far an arrow can go? I want you to imagine that that Achilles tendon is like the bowstring and it shoots the frog and it lets that frog jump anywhere from 10 times to 44 times its body length. That would be like if this young man right here, what's your name, my friend? Nevin. Nevin. If Nevin, you look like you're what, maybe about four feet tall? No. No, he's like, he's not that tall. So if Nevin was a frog, he could jump anywhere from Maybe to from there to here, or maybe all the way from there to the top of that building over there. And that tendon releases in another 100 milliseconds. So in one fifth of a second, Nevin could jump from here on top of that building if he was a frog. And who here wants to make some money? Me. You want to make some, anybody else want to make some money? Because if you want to make some money, you need to get a frog that's good at jumping because right now the world record, the Guinness world record for frog jumping is right about four feet. But that doesn't matter because you know what the real record is? 
you have to go to Calaveras County, California and enter the frog jump contest because the current Calaveras County frog jump record is 21 feet, five and three quarter inches. The frog gets three jumps, which means these frogs have been jumping about seven feet per jump. They're bullfrogs like the one I have right here. And the reason these people can get their frogs to jump farther than scientists can in the Guinness Book of World Records is because if you watch a video of people doing the Calaveras County frog jump, what they do is they specially train themselves to freak out frogs. They put the bullfrog here. The bullfrog gets three jumps. So what they do, they wait till the bullfrog's looking away from them and then they pretend they're like an alligator and they sneak up on the frog. And they go, Whoa! and they blow on its butt and it jumps and it jumps and it jumps. And if you get really good at blowing on a frog's butt and being like an alligator, you could win $5,000. So I hope one of you guys enters when you're a little bit older. Go to California, enter the frog contest and make $5,000. And let's keep going this way. Amazing permeable skin. You've got those amazing eyes. You have those amazing jumping legs that allow you to jump anywhere from 10 to 44 times your body's length. But it really also comes down to being able to eat food. And unfortunately, this is where the cartoons get it all wrong. Because who here can raise hand and tell me, how does a frog catch its food? What does it use? You, my friend. It's sticky tongue. It's sticky tongue. And if you watch a cartoon, a frog's tongue goes like, and it grabs an insect and goes shoom, and it pulls it back in and this part it's going to be kind of weird because i want you guys to stick out your tongues but i won't be able to see them so here stick out your tongue for me uh, okay with my x-ray vision i can tell you guys would all make horrible frogs because your tongues are all backwards or i should say a frog's tongue is backwards compared to ours because our tongues attach in the back and they stick out this way if you're a frog your tongue attaches in the front of your mouth and it whoop, it flops out and a frog can whoop, flop its tongue out really really fast but it really doesn't go that far so here my papers are stuck together here's a frog flopping its tongue out and if you want to see how far a frog's tongue could go, I want you to go home and I want you to get a dinner plate. I want you to hold that dinner plate up right to your mouth. And I want you to try to grab the food on the far side with your tongue. Take a video of it and put it up on YouTube and send it to me. No, don't do that. That would be really silly. But that's about as far as the frog tongues go. It really only goes about as far as its head for most of our frog species. But it does it really, really fast. Here. And the interesting thing is, if you look at this picture, you can see the frog closes its eyes when it sticks out its tongue. That's not a mistake in this photograph. That's what always happens. Whenever a frog flops out its tongue, its eyes automatically close, which means it needs to figure out where its prey is, and then it has to close its eyes and try to get it. So I want you to do that experiment at home too. I want you to like figure out where the Brussels sprout is. Then I want you to close your no, eyes. Well, then you'll you grab it with your fork or something. But they have those giant eyes. They don't want to damage them. So they close them. And again, their distance up close isn't that good anyways. So they're kind of judging by where that last movement was. Then they close their eyes, grab it with their tongue, pop it back in. And here's the thing. We like to think that frogs eat bugs, right? Yeah. Everybody knows, oh, they eat flies. Well, frogs, <laughs> since they don't have good close vision, they eat anything that moves that's next to them. They will eat insects, they will eat little worms, they will eat little crustaceans, they will eat... Well, here, let's figure out what this guy ate. What did this guy eat? That's another frog. Another frog! When I was a kid, I used to keep frogs together in a bucket. I always had a bucket of frogs. And I was always disappointed when my bucket of frogs turned into fewer frogs because the big frogs would eat the little frogs. So they will eat. If you're a bullfrog like my bullfrog over here, you might eat garter snakes. You might eat mice. You might eat small birds. You might eat anything that gets in front of your face that you can whack with your tongue and pull into your mouth. And this little frog was a little bit confused here. What did that guy try to eat? A firefly. It's not a firefly. It's a Christmas light. What? 
This frog ate a Christmas light. I don't know why. But it happened. That frog is so dark. How is it? If it went into his mouth. Oh, How is it wow. Cool? Like, In a case like that, can it pull away from it without hurting itself? Yeah, the story of this frog is the person who owned those Christmas lights, they came out and they found the frog on it, and they did take the frog and go, poop, and they popped it off. So the frog was okay, and no Christmas lights were hurt either, because it's just a squishy little frog. But if you're a frog, you do have a pretty amazing tongue. It's just not as crazy long as the cartoons make you think it is. That would be like a chameleon tongue. But again, go home, put your dinner plate right up here, and try to eat the food on the far side with just your tongue. That's what it's like to be a frog. So we're going to go walk a little bit farther. Let's walk over this boardwalk right here and see what we can see. I'll meet you guys on the far side. Go see what you can see as you're walking you guys. this way. Do frogs need to use toothpaste no. when they brush their teeth? No. Do frogs have teeth? No. Have you ever seen frog teeth before? No. OK, well. <laughs> Frogs don't have teeth like you and me. They don't have these nice, beautiful things covered in enamel. But did you know that some species of frogs do have teeth? But that's just weird. I'm going to show you some. Yeah, that one's just weird. Frog teeth. Here's some frog teeth. Yeah. There's actually two kinds of frog teeth. There are maxillary teeth, which are these little tiny nubbins up here. And then some of them actually have something we call vomerine teeth, which are little nubbins on the roof of the mouth, but they don't chew with them. They don't have to floss them. All those teeth do is they're little bumps that help them hold on to their prey. Because a frog or a toad swallows its prey whole. And if you're a toad, you don't have any teeth at all. And I'm gonna take my toad out. Actually, let's just take the toad out right now while we're talking about teeth. Because one of the things that sets the American toad apart is that the American toad has no teeth at all. And here's the thing that'll blow your minds. A toad is a frog. Toads are just a kind of frog. So all toads are frogs, but not all frogs are toads. And toads tend to be a little bit lumpier, a little bit wartier. Their back legs tend to be a little bit stumpier. They're not as good at jumping. But again, nature loves to break every rule it makes because there are species of toads that have really slick skin and that are pretty good at jumping. But in our state, the toads we find, the American toad and the Fowler's toad out west, look lumpy and bumpy and they do not have teeth. But they're beautiful. I'll let you touch, well, we'll talk about that at the very end, my friends. Because now, if you're a frog or a toad, you've got your prey, but there's something even more important than eating, and there's something even more important than surviving. It's finding love. So let's walk this way. I want you to be thinking about toad and frog love while you're walking that way. Everybody in the mood for like frog love then? Because if we're talking about frog love, we have to talk about frog ears. Because if you're a frog, you don't have these cool, big, floppy things like you and me. You just have this circle behind your eye. We call it your tympanic membrane or your tympanum, which is basically the eardrums on the outside. And for my friend, the bullfrog here, you know my bullfrog is a boy because his ear is bigger than his eyeball. If that ear was about the same size or smaller than the eyeball, it would be a female frog. And it's usually that way for most of our frogs. Most of our frogs, the males have the bigger ear than the female. And when I'm talking about love, in the springtime, it's the males who are trying to attract the females and they're doing it with their calls. So the first thing you're typically gonna hook here in the springtime is something that sounds kind of like this. Frog's just staring at me. Is he staring? <laughs> and I'm sure a lot of you have heard that maybe by where you guys live. Every night. And those chorus frogs, those little boy chorus frogs are out and they are calling, they're saying, come on ladies, I've got me a pond. Oh, we're going ahead with the game here. 
And I'd really love it for you to come over here. In Michigan, down here in the southeast, usually the second one that we hear are our spring peepers. And they're the ones that are like... Let's see if I can turn this up some more. Mom. Can you hear that peep? And around here, usually the third one we hear is the wood frog. And I love the wood frog because it sounds like there's a bunch of quacking ducks back in the woods. And if you really want to learn your frog calls, I would recommend that you come back later on today for the River Raisin program. That's going to be with Larry here. Larry knows a lot more about frog calls than I do. He's been doing this for decades and he's going to be talking about frog calls. But the neat thing about those first three frogs, oh, I love this because if you're a chorus frog or a spring peeper or a wood frog, you're called what we call an explosive breeder. And that just sounds cool to be an explosive breeder. That means they all come and they breed at the same time. All the chorus frogs sing together, all the peepers sing together, all the wood frogs sing together, and they try to get all the ladies to come all at once. And you might have a pond that has no frogs in it. And over the space of two weeks, you get hundreds of frogs there. And then you have bazillions of eggs because if you lay all your eggs together, it's hard for a predator to eat all of them. So those frogs, is kind of like this big party of love. And here's the really cool thing. Even though the males are doing all the singing, it's the females that pick the guy they like. And it's really kind of cute. If you watch the, the females come up, they'll come up and they'll kind of come up and they'll just gently kind of like touch one of the males that they like. And then they'll go off and they'll do their little thing. But the other frogs here, like our bullfrogs and our green frogs that may later in the season, they're what we call prolonged breeders. So the chorus frogs, once they do their two, three weeks, they're done. But then our other frogs, like our green frogs and our bullfrogs. Here, let me pull up a green frog for you. This one's one of my favorite. Sounds like a banjo. And then the bullfrog. And you'll hear those through the whole summer. Because again, these frogs are prolonged breeders. They breed for a long time. They stay out of territory. A little more bullfrogs. And here's the last one I'm gonna call because we haven't heard my friend the toad yet. Where's my toad? I think this is the most beautiful. So are they doing that with their tongue or just like, what is it exactly that is creating that? Yeah, that's a great question. What is actually making that sound is they're pumping air through what we call their vocal sac. So they're making it with their larynx, just like our larynx makes our voice. But then they have this big sac that bulges out that kind of like amplifies it and echoes it. And here's my question for you guys. The toads only call for a couple weeks in the spring. Like behind my house, they call, and if you if you don't listen for those couple days, you miss it. So if the toads are only calling for a couple days or a couple weeks, are they explosive breeders or are they prolonged breeders? Are they prolonged? They're, ex they're explosive. They all come together at the same time, and they just go mating crazy. Toads are the ones where the guys get a little rough. They're not quite as nice to the ladies as a lot of the other frogs. But... It's all about that next generation and having that froggy love. So, let's take all of our kid love here and let's go head this way. You have that amazing permeable skin. You've got those big old eyeballs. You have those amazing jumping legs. You have that floppy tongue. You have those sometimes little tiny teeth. And you are adapted to live in our wetlands, our marshes, our lakes, our ponds, our rivers, our streams, our backyard puddles. But one of the problems for frogs is they need that water. And like Brittany's post for this program said, 60% of the wetlands in Michigan just aren't here anymore. 
we like to build houses and we don't want to build a house on something that's going to flood so we fill it in and if you take away 60 percent of the habitat for these creatures you're not going to have as many of those creatures and since they have that permeable skin any toxins that we dump into the water or into the soil it goes right into their bodies and that's another thing that hurts them and one of the really neat things you can do is i have right here the DNR's frog and toad status for 2019 and 2020. If you learn your different frog calls, which you could do with Larry tonight, you can take part of the Michigan frog surveys where you go out and you listen for frogs to see if they're in your area. And unfortunately, if you look at all the trend lines for basically every single frog species, they're, they're all going down a little bit. And that's why it's so important for us to care about frogs and toads and to care about the wetlands and try to preserve them, which is why Crosswinds March is such an amazing place because this is a man-made wetland that was put here by the, the airport because they filled in some wetlands when they made the airport. So they gave some wetlands back and now we have all kinds of frogs and toads that live out here. So I wanna thank you guys so very much for coming out and joining me today. I hope this adds to your understanding of frogs and toads. One of the questions we had come up is, can we touch them? And unfortunately, since they have that permeable skin, if I let everybody here touch my frog or my toad, it can put toxins into their body and it can be more than my toad could handle. So I'm not gonna let you touch my frog or my toad right now. But if you're outside, I'm gonna totally encourage you to catch frogs and toads. Kids are supposed to catch frogs and toads. It's like one of the laws of nature. But when you do it, make sure you don't have like bug spray all over your hands. Make sure you don't have like sunblock smeared all over you. What I like to do when I'm gonna catch an amphibian, a frog or a toad or salamander, I like to get my hands a little bit dirty first. I kind of rub them in the grass, I get them in the water, and that gives them a little bit of a protective barrier. It gets rid of some of the oils and things on my skin that might hurt that frog or that toad. But I will open up the container so you can see them a little bit more closely. And if it jumps out, well, I'm not gonna open that one because this guy, he's too big and too fast. And if he gets three leaps, I mean, he could do three leaps and go 20 feet. So I don't wanna lose him in the marsh. But if you wanna see the toad, I will open up the toad. He wants to get out. But again, I wanna thank you guys so much for joining me today. I wanna thank you for caring about your frogs and toads. We love to see you out at the Metro Parks or out at the Wayne County Parks or out at the events put on by the River Raisin Institute. I'll be hanging around for a little bit if you have any other frog or toad questions. And again, thank you guys so much for coming today because we appreciate you because we know that you guys appreciate the frogs and the toads. So thank you very much. Oh my God. Yeah, yeah.